presentation as a chef is one thing. Presentation as an Instagrammer is something completely different. When our table is for three, it's not for three, it's for 3,000. So welcome back to the podcast here at the Go Agency with Mark McCulloch and I'd just like you to introduce yourself really. Yeah, your, your voice went up there slightly, <laughs> just sort of, <laughs> Mark McCulloch, <laughs> I think, um, because this has all came about quite quickly, which is great. Yeah, no, it's um, been great. So I got a last minute shout from, from Esme. So how would I describe myself? So I guess brand and marketing consultant in the but main. But you love food and drink. With a digital bit. Yeah, you don't have this waistline, you know, working in fashion, I suppose. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've been in food and drink for 12 years, something like okay. that. So I've got a consultancy just almost to legitimise me, I suppose, called Supersonic Inc. Um, so it's a little bit of Oasis and a little bit of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask uh, if there was an Oasis thing. <laughs> yeah, well, what, what actually happened was, just a quick aside, was my brand mentor, a guy called Robert Bean, who's done a lot of great brands over the years, uh, he kind of did his magic, his Mr. Miyagi, if you like, on me, um, and he spits out your brand really as two words. So it came out as Rocket Booster, and he kind of left me with that thought, and for a few hours and he was coming back. And I was just doing the old usual marketing thing, which is, you know, thesaurus.com and yep. looking around the internet and da da da. And uh, yes, supersonic and supersonic booms and all that stuff kind of came up. And I thought, there's something interesting in that. And then through a bit of searching, you know, it, it was available to, to, to have. So And the Sonic movie's coming out this And the Sonic, well, regrettably, um, <laughs> with, with a new character. Yeah. Um, needs a bit of work. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. About I'm not sure about how they're going to make a feature link <laughs> film about that character. So there's that. And then I suppose, without sounding too much of a wanker or anything, but I've started like a personal brand, I suppose. I've always kind of had it, I suppose, but I'm focusing on that. So I've went with Mark McSee because it's easier to say than Mark McCulloch, uh, just a little bit easier to, to recognize. So I'm starting to get into monetizing podcasting, monetizing speaking, workshops, facilitation. And yeah, I think it's to have stand out in the market as you first, yep. and then you might have a company second. So what was I, the, let's start with that. I think that's mm. really interesting. It's something we're obviously doing with the vlog. So we daily sure. vlog every single day on LinkedIn, yep. uh, across the business, and then we create podcasts mm. every week. With all sorts of different guests, we've had you know um, the youngest football um, owner in the UK on, um, and that podcast went out today. Great, um, and all the way through to you know marketeers. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to create a different kind of podcast than just a classic marketing podcast. Yeah, and really talking about human stories, and that's kind of what we realised three months ago that people wanted to watch yes. and get into. Ever since yeah. the Netflix boom has come around, people really just want to see documentaries and cool things about different things they yeah. didn't really know about. So yeah. I thought, oh, we'll just fling open the doors and show you what's going on and yeah. show other human stories. So your personal branding mm -hmm. experience so far, what has that been and why now? Well, I, I think it's always sort of been there. And I think whether it's been, you know, my size maybe or my look or uh, my accent definitely stands out down here a little bit more than you know every other Londoner or whatever um, so I think it was like a combination of things uh, that all kind of were coming together and I think from having the agency that I had which was called We Are Spectacular I did see that people wanted to work with you yep. and it was your name that was almost more important than, than the agency name that people can not really remember or you know yeah so I think people still buy people and I think also to get your reach it's it's funny some of the questions that came through before I was just looking at in the train coming down from Manchester and one of the things that I was thinking about was the networking side of things and I think it played into that as well where although I'm quite extrovert and all these things and loud and bold and whatever. I think actually I, I struggle with the networking side of things and the small talk and the, you know, yep. I get anxiety and sort of break out in a sweat. I can stand up on stage and talk to the room, but actually when it's one-to-one -one and all that milling about and you've got to make up stuff. And so I actually thought if I project myself out there. How you want it to be. How you want it to be, people will feel like they know you. And then that's broken down a barrier when someone comes up to chat to you and it's already started happening where people are saying, 
I listened to the podcast or, you know, I was in a pub one night and somebody recognised my voice. You know, it was a guy called David Lightfoot and, you know, bless him, this was in the really early days and he said, oh, are you Mark McCulloch from the Spectacular podcast as it was then? Mm. And I couldn't believe it, you know, because I was having a chat with my business partners at the time about how it might be a waste of time and, and doing that. So it was really fortuitous that, that that happened. So I think a lot, of, it kind of happened organically, but what I was seeing was the personal brand thing now more than ever is so um, important. And also I wanted to put out content and I was seeing that I was preaching on stage about how it's all about content and da da da, but actually I wasn't putting out any. Practicing what you preach. Yeah, so I thought I've got to do this. And I've always had a wee sort of penchant for radio, you know, hospital radio, university radio, that sort of stuff. The voice is much better than the face. Um, so, you know, I'm We're doing both a, trying to cover yeah, it up, right? <laughs> that's true, yeah. If I get shaved, I'm divorced. <laughs> um, so I think there's a little bit of that where. I'm going to need to do the video stuff because it's just part and parcel of it. But I think it's just about not being uncomfortable with that, just getting on with it. But I'm really focusing on the, the broadcasting side of things to try and actually just bring free advice to people about brand marketing, digital social, from and also a bit of experience from the 20 years of been doing it so that they don't make the same mistakes that I made. Yeah. Um, across the, the time, you know, I want people to have an easier ride and be more confident in their jobs and do things better than, than I did. And podcasting has become a big, big thing mm -hmm. in the last few years. Mm. It, I talk about it quite a lot, but it was huge in 2011, 2012, mm. had its kind of breakthrough, yep. and then it died off. It died. No one could monetize it. Yep. And they had these huge audiences, but no one could monetize it. And went, oh, YouTube's paying some money. We yep. should do it there. Yep. And then we've seen, I don't know what triggered it, but we've seen a huge upsurge in podcasts that are being created and more importantly the mm. demand for it the, the people that are listening to them yeah in the last two years two and a half years yeah. how how do you th go about generating that audience because podcast is a bit different to all the other social media that you can't just put out podcasts and expect people to find mm. it's far more word of mouth or you need to have an audience to begin with in order to drag them across to what is very very long form content yeah. like how did you begin that journey um i was a little bit screw it let's do it mm -hmm. and i'll figure it out i hoped that you know being a marketer for all these years i hoped i'd be able to do it i actually didn't go in too much with too much of a marketing plan i just thought the biggest barrier the biggest thing that's holding me back is what will other people think you know so the biggest thing was getting it up there yeah and then everything else would just work it out. In terms of my competitive set in food and drink, there's no one doing what I'm doing. And it was just such a big gap. And if I didn't do it, someone else was gonna. And I, that was spurring me on to do it. And then I think in terms of the, you know, getting it out there and all the rest of it, I just deployed my audience attention really. So if I was speaking, I would mention it. If I was in meetings, I would mention it. I put it on, you know, the signature on my email and you're sending thousands of emails a week, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I also then looked at, you know, I actually got one of the, the, the women that worked with me, Gabby, who she was just like, still is, you know, a, a young, curious thing, not to be patronizing to her, but the energy of just going, oh, do you know if we, you know, smash this app in, it'll do the subtitles for us for less cost. Do you know if we put it on Libsyn, it'll syndicate it out. Do you know if we do this? Um, we really luckily through an amazing guy called Martin Morales who runs um, Ceviche, uh, the restaurant, mm -hmm. um, he and Andina, he um, used to work at iTunes. So he right. pulled a string and we got on to like new and noteworthy, um, which really helped. Um, I remember then, getting back. I remember getting on new and noteworthy in 2012. <laughs> right. and it gave us 20,000 new listeners yeah, that yeah. week. Yeah, it's massive. And then I just got it to propel its own success. So if we were in the top 200, I would post it. We got to number three in the marketing chart. I would clip it and post it. So you'd need to give it its own hype as well. For sure. And you need to be obsessed by it. And people want to know the numbers. They want to know how many downloads you've got. They want to know when you're peaking. They want to know when you've overtaken Gary V one week, you know, which was the best week of my life, I think, you know. Um, didn't last long right enough, but you know, it was great. Um, and then, the guests helped, you know, the guests yep. then Network. told 
a hundred people that then they come, they got people to listen to it. So it was kind of this sort of natural thing. But the decision, the most important decision I made was quadrupling down on LinkedIn. So I realised that Insta's fine for me, but actually for pushing out B2B stuff, it wasn't particularly right. And something I'd been told a while ago was, you know, about being a, a coach, not a player on, mm -hmm. on, on Insta. So I was dying trying, you know, getting a huge audience on there and all the rest of it. And I was a bit too late to, without proper thought. So I saw that, you know, LinkedIn had, had a really big network, big following. Mm. And I thought that's where I'm going to push it out the most. And that's where I seem to get the most sort of traction, I suppose, if you want to use a so rubbish word. LinkedIn's obviously become a huge player in the last yeah. 18 months yeah. in general. Yeah. Um, how how does it differ? Like you talked about it in the fact that you weren't feeling that much success in other ways. Mm. You, like how does it differ as a platform for you to get that content out? How, what sort of message do you adopt for mm -hmm. people listening to this like who are trying to get reach for podcasts or other content they're kind of trying to create? And we're, we're part of that, right? Yeah. And so you on your own you're trying to get more people to listen to your podcast like yeah. what are the tactics you're you're using in order to get people to see and care about what you're doing on linkedin well there's a bit of a dual strategy i suppose so i've got a marketing team or you know one person plus producer doing the stuff so you know clipping the highlights whether it's video or whether it is just the little sound wavy thing going yep. um you want to pick out Sort of spiky stuff and, and, and put that out there as a quote. Uh, for a while there, I haven't done it lately, but you know, it's a bit rubbish. But I was putting pictures of me with it, you know, a quote from it, or yep. I was just trying all these different things to see what would happen. I think also I was making sure that I was using LinkedIn messaging really well. Yeah, okay. And it's hard work. You just sit and you got all your contacts, the ones you want to contact, the ones that you feel you can speak to. And don't cut and paste, you know, write them a nice note, one by one by one by one, and say, hi, I haven't spoken for a while, how's, and I'm lucky that I've got a kind of memory that is quite good for like CEOs and stuff, which is, I remember stuff about people, I'll remember their kid's name, or I'll remember like one fact or two facts, yep. not, you know, if they're a more distant person. So you want to replay that, and people then feel, rather than a cold call, or they know it's cut and pasted, or you're using them, you're taking advantage of them, you're actually saying, hey, for you, there's this podcast, and we say this, and it might be helpful for your business, or for you, actually get your teams to listen to it, because it's free training, mm. you know, all these kind of things. Also, being really active in LinkedIn community, so being really positive on people's comments, and what they're saying, answering stuff, not being a troll, you know, there's so many people that just want to suck the life out of things and, and it's not helpful so if there's a way to put your podcast in there you know if there's a lot I mean lately we, there was a lot of noise about Carlsberg you know with the probably not stuff mm -hmm. so luckily we had the VP of marketing on last week so then you could say to people if they posted about Carlsberg say well here's the true story here you yep. know and, and that kind of stuff getting a sponsor really helped you know, we got a sponsor this year, uh, BDO, who are like an accountancy firm um, for food and drink. So I didn't want to get a restaurant or anything because it would just be too conflicty. You want yep. it to be free. Um, they've been hugely supportive working with me. They know it's not huge numbers as I grow this new podcast, but they're with me for the journey. That might change eventually. Um, but it just gave you a bit of stability so you could afford to have the studios, get them filmed, you know, just have a little, you know, Willing to helped. increase the quality, right? Which is what yeah. keeps the retention. Yeah, because it's four or 500 pounds an episode, you mm. know, by the time you do the marketing person, the, the producer, your time's not even, you know, in that. The studio, the this, the that, um, you know, the simple cast cost, the, you know, all adds up, you know? So actually you're not getting much change out of 750 quid. If you film it properly as well, you're looking at 1500 or more. Mm. Um, if you don't have the agency support, yeah, yeah. you know, round about you that you're paying for anyway. So at the old agency, I had that, this new, you know, it's just me. So you're, you're either ha putting your hand in your own pocket or you're not. But I think hugely enjoying it and, and it's a business development tool. You know, it really is. And you seem like a future thought leader by doing this, mm. you know, from, and it, either people don't know where to start, they've got all the excuses for not doing it, or they're just doing the same old marketing, which means that eventually they'll just be standing still, if not going backwards, but hopefully 
this is propelling me forward. And you talk about food and drink and marketing in general, yeah. digital marketing and social and obviously drawing yeah. your experience from that industry. Yeah, well, it's interesting what you said about the human stories side of things. Interestingly, I've set this up as a, you know, marketing podcast, but actually the great sort of podcasts I've had in the last few few weeks have actually been people's founders' stories. Mm -hmm. So Bill from Bill's, Tom at Honest, Zan at Bleaker Burger, um, the Pizza Pilgrims guys. So All great. Which has been amazing, Places. yeah. And they've had their story to tell. So there's a little bit in me that's thinking it might end up going that way a little bit more, which is career stories, you know, brand it could stories. It be a strand, couldn't it? it could yeah. be like founders, food founders stories. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think there's lots of opportunity for the that. The ugly guys, the ugly drink guys have got a great story as well. Yes, you? yeah. Like those, I mean, no, I, have, I haven't met them, but yeah, that would be amazing to. To, 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 to do that. And then I think there's other strands as well where... I did uh, one with Fat Boy Slim last year, and that started to turn it into a public interest podcast rather than because it wasn't, you know, he's not a marketer or it was just him talking like about food and drink. Desert Island discs. A for little food bit. And drink. A little bit, which off menu podcast happened with James Acaster and yeah. Ed Gamble, and that was a little bit like, oh man, that was exactly what I fancied doing. So, but there's other ideas, you know. So I, th I I'd like to think there's maybe we'll start spreading that out a bit and you're getting to meet the people that you love as well so and I imagine why the not? perks are pretty good as well talking food food and drink yeah, yeah. It's, it's good you know it's, it's quite interesting you do got a lot of people saying oh can you get me a freebie and it, it doesn't really work like that you know if no. someone chooses to shout you great but you don't really ask for it but you know I think it's quite interesting to to to, to just be part of food and drink and, and help support the industry and champion it as well so let's talk about the career yep. um, and why you've put yourself in a position where that's kind of your thought leadership piece in, in mm. food and drink digital marketing yep. so where did it all begin let's talk about your human story like sure. what's, what started the fascination or what started the career in this sector yeah well there's a hop skip and a jump probably before food okay which is, um, I started out in the music magazine, so I was doing student marketing for Loaded and NME and, and all this kind of fun stuff. And music is my one, my true love, really. Okay. Um, but then I was almost gathering evidence or gathering experience where I was like, worked in an agency, you know, that was fine. Then I started working in-house, got some sales training at insurance. I got into digital through an, a motivation agency. I then started at lastminute.com and Barclay Card. So smashing all that together, you've kind of got, um, you know, leisure stuff. You've got web. You've got strategic, you know, blue chip stuff at Barclay Card. Um, you know, and a few other bits and bobs all clicking into place. So then when I was at Barclay Card, it wasn't really a job for me. You know, it, it was good for my CV. It wasn't particularly good for me. So... Is that because of bureaucracy and yeah. politics within the business and yeah not I'd, enough freedom i wasn't a good fit you know i think i was used to being someone's number two or number three not someone's number eight you know um and i, I really struggled with that where everything was really strategically done which mm. is the right thing to do but i like you know agility and fast moving stuff and hey let's have this idea and you know I was talking to you earlier about just out there in, in, in Finsbury Square you yeah, know yeah, down, yeah. down there you know we launched the first beach in London on a whim at lastminute.com for under 20 grand and it took a few weeks to put together so I was used to that so I just felt constrained it just wasn't the best use of me really but learned loads and all that so I saw an advert for Yo Sushi in marketing week and I hadn't picked it up for months it's really fortuitous you know I looked through and it says senior market manager at the time I was like that might be quite good you know I mean I could drop a ton of salary but it'd be fun and I remembered you from when I worked at the music magazines okay. I used to go there and I used to absolutely love it and it was a huge change for me moving from where I moved from like eating sushi I mean it was like some eating an alien or something you know yep. um, so I wrote them a ransom note and said um, help I've been captured by a bunch of bankers I'm being held ransom um, you know could you help give me a job kind of thing and I was at Blur at Hyde Park um, very very drunk and I got a call uh, just before they were coming on and it said hi it's so and so at Yo Sushi um, we want you to come in for an interview tomorrow and I was like so I sobered up pretty quickly and thought I'd better get myself. So it was five interviews and then I got the job. And it wasn't until I started that I really started to love food and drink as an industry. And what happened was, I've told this a few times, which was my CEO, Robin, at the time, was an amazing man. 
he came out, and I'd only have been a few weeks in maybe, and he said, um, I want you to meet someone in my office. I said, okay. So I walked into his office, and it was this guy, and he was the CEO of Ping Pong. And I was going, I can't believe you're having a meeting, sharing strategy, figures, all these things, with a quite a big competitor. I don't understand. But then the penny drops, where it's like, actually, we're all trying to get people to eat out and drink out. Ping All Pong is my favourite restaurant. Ping Pong, yeah, uh, yeah I love restaurant. it. Yeah, I've not been for a long time actually, but me and my wife used to go all the time. It's I fantastic. thought it was great. I just haven't been for a bit. But they yeah. closed the one down in Westfield, Stratford, oh, and did they? swapped it for a Five Guys. Oh, okay. But it was fantastic, and it was it was a great delivery food because you can have loads of different things. Yes. That's yeah, the beauty yeah, yeah. of dim sum, really, and yep. the, the fantastic sort of. Um, higher level ping pong is Yuacha in City oh, yes. and in yep, Soho yep. Uh, and I just love dim sum because yeah. you have so many different things yeah all the variety yeah, yeah it's like you've got the big piles of the oh it's fantastic <laughs> no it's great that's a bit of a trip back and you've got to scribble on your little menu oh and, you it's know, brilliant the, all the, great. The, the St. Catharines dock ping pong uh-huh. is very good because okay. you can sit right outside on the uh, by all the boats yeah 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 um, and yeah they do all of them do like an all you can eat Sunday. Oh, okay, yeah, um, yeah, which is pretty good. That'll work. Yeah, we did that. You sushi it's like an all you can eat called sumo Sundays, and um, what we didn't realise was there was lots of Asian families coming in, and they weren't eating the rice, so they were just you know loading up in the fish. So we had to change the rules uh, so that because right, they weren't getting full, you know, which is going yeah. and just all this wasted High rice, value, you know. Yeah. So we had to say to them. So yeah, so f- from that, and then once you start going to industry dues, and. Uh, seminars and these events that you have and speeches and this and that what was interesting was because i was an outsider people really wanted to get to know you because they were like i wonder what he knows how big he, were you sushi when you started how many um, roughly how many restaurants 50 60 people or restaurants oh sorry restaurants but Pe- both so 56 oh, people people oh god i couldn't even tell you uh, that's terrible I, i'd name a number but i'd be lying i mean head office was always very lean um, in terms of out there, yeah, I'd, I'd be guessing. I'd be guessing. But thousands of people, yeah, yeah. thousands. Um, and this was what year? 2009, 2008, okay. 2009. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I just, just left Bartley Card and went over there. Feels like that was sort of the time when the uh, higher level fast food was coming into London. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I might be wrong. It just feels like I got like about 10 years ago that level of like wasabi prep became big like all these different things really started yeah. to push themselves into the yeah um where fast food had traditionally been mcdonald's burger king kfc yeah um and now you know even in the last few years you've got eat which has obviously just been acquired yep. um pure like mm-hmm. all these other pod yeah they're they're only in the last really since we've moved to shoreditch so since yeah, we, yeah. about three years yeah um but before that, there was a surge of others. Wasabi's been around for six, seven, eight years in London, as far as I'm, because I was eating it at my last yeah. job, which was 2014. Yeah, okay, But it's kind of came in waves, you know? So yeah. early doors, you're right, you know, you had the, the, the fast food stuff, and, and then you had the beef eaters, and, yes. you know, and that kind of wave, and Pizza Express been around since 1965, you know? So it's like, you know, and then there was a second phase, which was the fast casual sort of, you know, which was maybe f- fifteen years ago or so. There was Who the would you main put in players. That section? Um, you'd be looking at you know your bills. Um, you would be your asks, your prezos. Okay. Yeah. You know all that kind of wave, ZZ, all that. I mean, it might even be slightly older than that, but that kind of felt like when they. No, were I think that's about right. I, I remember because I'm 24, so yeah, I probably saw a ZZ for the first time when I was nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, I remember. And then Wagamama was like, "Wow, you can do Japanese food in London." Yes. Yeah. That so was the first breakthrough. Wags was definitely he had just starting. I would. I mean, when we get this wrong, but I was like 2000 ish. Um, there was a couple of Wagamamas around, but there was things like, you know, Belgo was going at the time, you know, but then as, as you're saying, almost that to go wave then came yes. as well. So as you're saying, you know, Pret Eat, da, 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 all these, but I mean, Pret 1986, you know, it started. So um, it only then had a few by the mid nineties and then, you yeah, know, the explosion push. happened. Um, so there was all that. And then of course there was a wave of independence, actually more independent proper restaurants happening. And then obviously street food, 
on top of that. So it's just became such a saturated market. So the eating out market hasn't really changed massively in terms of the amount of people going out or not or whatever. Um, it's actually been the, the competition that's eaten itself, if you excuse the pun. Another thing is, you know, the investor side of things, you know, investors were coming in with their wallet, not their heart, you know? Yep. So they were coming in just seeing an opportunity like they probably are with cannabis now or, or whatever. It was mm -hmm. just, we can take this from this price and by the time we're done, we'll get X Coco on Coco de Mama, good example of that. Is that owned by PE firm? It's owned by the Azuri Group, who I'm not sure of the ownership structure of Azuri, but Azuri is also, I hope I'm getting this right, I always get them confused, but uh, it's easy. Um, okay. Radio Alice, which is a new um, sort of uh, pizza type cool thing. Um, but they just won Restaurant Group of the Year, um, okay. Azuri. So Coco de Mama is actually from what I see and what I hear, doing pretty well. I think the branding's pretty strong. Mm. Um, I think it's they had Snapchat branding. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think same that's as, a good same way as to... um, hippies as well. Yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, it's not popcorn, but it's like. Um, oh, I know what you mean. The yeah, yellow, yeah, yeah, the yellow yes. packet crisp. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's got amazing Snapchat branding. Yes, like, really pops. Yeah, yeah. In, into your eye. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it looks good. I think. Um, yeah, and I think they've just concentrated on. Slick service, you know, coffee's really good there. Um, and there's a bit of a disco vibe going on, you know, it's always kind of loud and energetic and, you know, bright. And I think that's what people need in the mornings, you know, in lunch times. Agreed. And going back to Yo Sushi, so yeah. that, that you spent a decent amount of time at Yo Sushi, sort of learning craft? Not or? really. Um, I, I'm a mover. Right. You know, I tend, I don't, I've got real commitment issues. You know, I, I, I move, 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 move. I was there a couple of years. Okay. Um, that's not bad. So I just felt that I had done as much as I could do to, to help um, with, you know, the, the support structure, the budgets, the, where it was all going. Um, and it was just a natural time for me to sort of move on, really. Um, and, yeah, I've kind of been like that with jobs. Last minute, they'll come as longer. It was about six years or five, five years. Um, and a lot crammed into that. And then, you know, a couple years at Barley Card, a couple years at Yo, uh, six months consultancy, really, gig at uh, Blink Box Music which became We Seven. Uh, sorry, We Seven which became Blink Box Music. And then Prep was a maternity contract. So I'd already started my agency but the Prep job was just too, too tempting good. To, 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 to not do it. And I was lucky enough to get it. I was really lucky. Yeah. So th let's talk about Prep as a uh -huh. as a company because you were in there when it was exploding or, you know, in that explosion phase. Yeah, I mean it was it was a year, um and I just went in there with the the you know, sort of MO, I suppose, just to be a sponge. Because every other job that I'd had, I was chasing sales, you know? Okay. So there was a term that Robin used to talk about, yo, which was being a promotions jockey. Um, and, you know, when your sales are behind, you make, usually make terrible decisions, knee jerk, everyone's in a panic, nothing's really thought through, and, it, and all roads are leading to discount or distress. And it's almost like if you're looking for a girlfriend or boyfriend and, you know, whatever it is, if you're in a relationship, you know, or comfortable in your own skin, you're a lot more assured than you are if, you know, you're desperate, you know. Yep. Um, and people can sniff that. You know, people can, can tell that's happening. So with pre, I mean, you would do the figures or you would attend the, the figures presentation on a Tuesday. And they'd go through the, the, the thing and they'd say, right, we're X hundred grand or this week, we're X over budget. Congratulations, have a good week. <laughs> you know, that yeah. was pretty much, whereas most places it's like, oh Christ, how am I going to explain that we're 50 grand down this week and, you know, and all the rest of it. So that assuredness and that accomplishment then just made for better decisions. So it meant that you were more relaxed. It meant that you are then, for example, spending your time thinking about exactly what it said on that sandwich box or exactly what that poster would be. And also, you were actually marketing six months, nine months out. And prep was so good that, you know, are so on it. As soon as Christmas had finished, the second it had finished, you were then doing a post-mortem of what happened. Really? And then you were straight on to this is what's going to happen the next time. So... They just, it was a well-oiled machine. You know, it was an absolute, you know, joy to be there. You know, it was, it was nice on the inside 
as you imagine it to be really from buying the stuff probably so yeah it was a real real fun um where do you see the food and drink sector moving like on the the market digital marketing space is moving so fast yep. different platforms are cropping up and down um different types of marketing of forming influencer marketing has been a, a core mm. um form of marketing for lots of these different brands mm -hmm. we're part of that we work mm. with a lot of different food and drink brands yeah uh, across the world yeah and when did you see that first come into into play did you see that at yo early on i bet so basically i was again thinking about how we could get the most standout amongst the competitive set so we were looking around and Facebook was sort of going, Twitter was going, Insta hadn't really happened at that point. Mm -hmm. And I took a bit of a proposal saying, look, you know, we need to do more than having a website. We actually didn't even have PPC, uh, didn't have much SEO. Um, so there wasn't a much really going into the engine to, to keep it going. and. We were thinking about it. it was actually a great FD we had um, called James. He's now at Nando's. And James was so supportive, just a frustrated creative marketer, like as an accountant, you know, mm -hmm. just to have someone like that on your side. And he just said to me, right, work up what you think needs to happen. And at the next board meeting, we'll say for the next year we need X. And brilliantly, they supported it massively. And I had 10 grand a month to spend on social. Now back then, that was a lot. it was nuts, right? So we had an amazing agency called Punctilio, who I think he got bought by Essence in the end, but they were just great. And they, the, the numbers went through the roof. You, we still see them now on Facebook, don't know about engagement and stuff. But at the time we were showing, we were getting brand points and we were getting sales points, you know? And if anyone was gonna do it, I mean, you felt like the most digitized experience that you could have at that time. Um, you know, with the belt and the tech and the, you know, the buttons and, you know, obviously it's Tokyo and all these things. So it just felt like the right thing to do. And I think it made a dramatic difference. But the good thing for me was I got to learn a hell of a lot while we were doing that too. So you could see that then and you could see that you were going to a first mover advantage on that. How much with Yo, and I'm sorry to focus on that, Sorry. Right? Like, it feels like where you really started to burn that desire in, in the food and drink space. Like, how much of it was changing perceptions of Japanese food or bringing that education of Japanese food into the English market yep. for f quick eating. Yeah. I think actually it was less about that and it was more about preaching to the choir and it was more about you being cool again. I mean, that was basically my brief. What can we do to make you cool again inside London? Outside London, when you were opening, whether it was I was at Manchester Piccadilly Yo today, which was great, great experience today. Um, the Milton Keynes one, it was like a spaceship landing. Inside London, the restaurants were looking a bit tatty. Customers are so promiscuous down here, you know, um, because there's so much action happening. You know, yep. they've got so much choice. And also, it was just the food quality just was being cut a little bit, I felt. Um, so there was a whole bunch of things to do for you to not persuade people to have Japanese food. My stance was always, if 5% of the market loves sushi, that's enough for us. It's a lot, you know? And I think it's the whole, you mentioned Jameson's earlier when we were chatting outside. Um, that's the whole thing they did. We're for the 1%. You know, that's, that was a strategy there's a while back. Might still be, I don't know. But um, from that perspective, I think it's about tripling down on the people that love you. Um, so all we had to do was persuade people to come and trial us. Not and you had the all the cool features. Or rejectors. You had all the cool features, or you were different enough that people could give you a go. Yeah. So what we did, um, we had a great campaign, which was called the You Love Us campaign. And we got Japanese in the main, Japanese looking at least, um, people are made up that way, that were all dressed as maids. And we got them to go around cities asking people to lose their sushi virginity. So would I do it now? Probably not. Back then it worked. Um, so there was around 20,000 plates went uh, with this campaign. Then the Metro picked it up 
um, and they what by working with them on some ads, they put us on the front cover six times in six weeks, I think it was, or six wow. times in eight weeks. You know that top box they used to have, which was free pint for everyone or whatever, yep. you know, Bombardier or whatever. Um, so yeah, it was free plate of sushi for, for everyone. Then Nissan got in touch and they said, we're launching a new car called Nissan Cube. Uh, can we have your team, your street team, called, they were called the Japarazzi, by the way, um, in our ads and you'll get all the data as well and we'll give you three cars to give away. Of course. No brainer. So I think it was just by, like, I, I, we, I, whatever, we were allowed to have an awful lot of fun. There was an awful lot of things, you know, we had to be constrained by as well. But Robin and, and the senior team there were, were just really good in terms of just going, do you know what, that sounds cool, let's do it. Um, so I think when I went in, Yo was trying to convert people to sushi eaters. And they had a strap line which was more than sushi. And to me, I think it feels apologetic. It's like Pizza Express yeah, yeah. saying more than pizza. It doesn't really say anything. Whereas if you're confident about who you are, you should quadruple down on that once you know what your brand stands for. And Yo Sushi is a great example of a brand that's done very well when it's moved to Uber Eats and Deliveroo, mm. or it certainly does in my household. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, it's travelized. It was the perfect, the, the, the perfect thing to go. I, I think there's a lot of food out there that doesn't travel well. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Like the Uber Eats and Deliveroo, I think have been great for the food economy in the way that it's allowed people to actually try different things, yeah. a lot of different things. Yeah. And, and the convenience of it is, is obviously so great. But and that's all that matters. Yeah, well certainly in this economy. You know, yeah, well, I, I think, if it's right for the customers and the market's the market, the market will tell you what they want, then it's a bit tough luck if you're not geared up towards that, you know? So I, I really feel that it's customer first. If that's what they want, you need to reposition yourself to be able to, to meet that need for sure. Are you a delivery Uber Eats user? For sure. <laughs> I'm an addict. Yeah, I mean, because I, I... Do you find I, yourself I, eating the same things or do you find yourself scrolling down, having a look at what's on? Yeah, and I, I, I have a look. You know, I think it is just what do you fancy. I mean, I, I'm i travelling a bit. You know, I live in Brighton, but I'm up in London a lot, so I stay in hotels and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, you know, I always think it feels a little bit... Dirty. Girl. Yeah, a little bit <laughs> like doing a drug deal or something like outside the hotels. But like, ooh. Um, but people are becoming more accepting of that. And there's a, there's a real point for hotels there as well. You need to embrace that. You yeah. need to figure out what your strategy and your, your plan is and your process for people wanting to do that. How does that work? You know, so... People, uh, some company would brand like a, a heating, you know, like a, a pass in restaurants where it's like heated lamps. Uh -huh. they, if a hotel did that in the lobby and yeah, someone branded yeah. it, whilst people drop their delivery in it, kept it hot whilst they come down the lift yeah. and down the stairs, that would be smart. That's a really good idea. You shouldn't have said that. You could have um, made a fortune. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not my field of expertise building pass lamps. Yeah. Um, but like th those sort of opportunities that people mm. have to see when in marketing that loads of these different companies can yeah. do that are really quick wins if they continue to move with the times and, and be smart about what generation they're marketing to. Yeah. And that's a good example. Hotels need to be smart right now on the yeah. fact that everybody, when they're staying there, especially on their own, is getting a delivery or, or yeah. an Uber Eats. Yeah, well, there, there, I mean, there's certainly a, 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 a percentage of, you know, and I, I think it's quite interesting because Uber Eats and Deliveries d disrupted, you know, so many industries, you know, whether it's the local off-license, the, you know, the, the hotels, as we're saying, the, the food, the drink, the... I mean, I think the bugbear of the industry, and, you know, I, I, I did a podcast lately with Gary Vee and Gary Vaynerchuk, and, and he talked about... He was really annoyed when I said this, but I was at a conference and someone from Uber Eats or Deliveroo came on stage, I think it was Deliveroo, actually, and they got booed. And I, and I got that when I was at lastminute.com, so when I stood up at a hotel conference and said, hi, I'm taking all your margin or whatever yeah, yeah, then yeah, yeah. but then you were also the cost of sale so i think it, it's just the fact that it's a shame for a lot of the people who have invested in restaurants have restaurants and all the rest of it that that's a gravy train isn't just going to keep going without attack and it's not your competitors that are your worry at all it's actually all these external forces of consumer needs delivery you know, takeaway, you know, all these different meal kits to homes. There's so much more for you to think about. That's even before you start thinking about marketing. 
you know, but I think that's probably the remedy more than the, the, the problem. So poor old restaurants, they've got an awful lot to sort of think about, you know, and I don't know the answers. I think all you can do is embrace, you know, the way that Robin did with ping pong, embrace your competitor, embrace the threat, yeah. and try your best to work out a way to figure out how this can work. Now, there's some interesting things happening where there's brands out there that are large restaurant chains who are partnering with Deliveroo to create skunk brands. So they might do Mexican food, but they've created just a skunk burrito brand with, because if Deliveroo have got, I do burritos and all the rest of it, if they've got all the information, what's popular in that day, in that area, to that household, I mean, they've got all the punchlines, they just need to write the jokes. So they're either going to do it themselves or you can partner with them. So I think it's dead exciting. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, because I grew up in digital, luckily, I'm absolutely buzzing about it. I think it's, there's so much opportunity. Yeah, I, I grew up in pubs and restaurants all my life. Ah. So I was born into restaurants yeah. and then up until the age of about 14. Where was this? Dorset and okay, Surrey. Great. Um, yeah, so between Bournemouth, and Paul, yeah. and then uh, like Farnham, Guildford. Great. Uh, so yeah, my dad owned restaurants, um, yeah. and I became a trained chef when I was thirteen. Oh wow! Just because I really wanted to be involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was the head of catering at the BBC. Right. Before I was born. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but he always wanted to own his own thing, and my parents met at uh, the Harvester that he ran. All oh, right. Uh, so I've like I've been in food's been my life. Been going through it. Um, I I was eating fillet steaks and lobster age 12, 13, right. just because I thought that was normal because yeah, that's yeah. what was on the that's menu. That's what was there. Um, and I could go downstairs and just ask the chef to cook me whatever I wanted just because yeah. that was just how my kitchen it life worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I look back on that and go, wow. Like yeah. I, was, I didn't know there was another steak other than fillet steak. Yep. <laughs> until 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, until I had to go and buy my own steaks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and... I think what's what's really interesting what um, struck a chord there was I saw my dad during difficult times and when the world changed yep. that really impacted business and yep. impacted how the business had to operate. The first one was the smoking ban. Sure. Like bang, like yep. no one drank at pubs anymore, yep. like literally overnight. And then he was like, okay, well he was the first pe- first pub in Dorset within a week to buy all of the outside heaters. Yeah. And then we saw over the next year outside heating companies going through the roof because yeah. everyone wanted to keep people in yeah, the pubs yeah, yeah. but keep the smokers and then uh, the Wall Street crash in yeah. 2008 which was massive for pubs and restaurants because uh, around the world because people didn't want to spend money on something luxurious like yeah. going out to eat and we were running like gastro pubs AA Rosette pubs around the, yeah, around yeah, the country yeah. so it was like I don't know, 14 to 25 pounds a dish. Mm. Uh, you know, 2005 to 2010, we were like top it's end punchy. gastro pub. Yep. Um, we were London prices in Surrey and in Dorset, so yeah. we were really bringing the right clientele, but as soon as that hit, yeah. no one wants to spend 20 pound on a nice piece of yeah. cake that evening. Yeah, Pe- people are looking for value then. I, st- I mean, something really hit me hard one of the times I was at one of these conferences, you know, and the guy... I think he was the CEO of Mitchells and Butler. Mm. Is that, that Harvester, Mitchells and Butler? Yes. Aye. Um, so, you know, Obar One, da da da. And he said, and it just shocked the room, I think. And he said, with some of the customers we've got with some of our brands, the decision to go out, this is why we can't let them down. This is why it has to be the best experience. And it might be a total bill of 20, 30 quid but we need it to be the best experience because it's the decision between one of the kids getting their football boots or you going out for dinner. And if you screw that up, you know, and I think when we're on this London bubble and we're used to yeah, eating yeah. out all the time, and there are, you know, we don't think about that. But That's fair. for other audiences and, and, and other people, and you know, or even if it is more expensive and you've got a bit of money, whatever it is, it has to, because they could have done something else with that. Mm. Um, and I think this next generation coming through, or, I mean, it's through. It's restaurant it's through. entitlement is what you're talking about. Like yeah, that. I think so. And and I think we've got a generation now, not to be too sweeping, but, you know, multitaskers, busy, you know, do they really want to get really dressed up and go out? And, you know, so that, that so it's either super convenient or it's a big occasion. And that middle is just then going to 
get That's squeezed. kind of what Jamie Oliver's seen, right? There's a lot of different problems there, but he yeah. sat in that middle. He was expensive, but not classy for the night out, and he yeah. was too expensive for the quick meal harvester yeah. level or yeah. Pizza Express. I, th- I think we'll definitely, sadly, see see more casualties in that middle middle bracket. And I think either you've got to be incredible value for money at whatever level, mm-hmm. or you've got to be the standout product. And the thing with Jamie's early on was it was, you know, the product was absolutely brilliant. You know, I'd never seen olives that size in my life, you know, served in a tray of ice and all mm. the rest of it. Um, the pasta, all freshly made. I know, you know, they still went on about that towards the end, but it just seemed to be that people stopped believing. Yeah, I, I loved his reason. other restaurants. There wasn't a massive Jamie's Italian yeah. pub, but I loved 15. Yeah. And I loved Barbacoa. Yes, yes. I right. thought they were fantastic restaurants. Yeah, very good. Um, there's two two more things I want to talk uh-huh. about. One is linked to the Uber Eats. Mm-hmm. Deliveroo experience that we're now seeing across, across the country, across mm. the world. And that's what your opinions are on restaurants that are setting up just for that. Mm-hmm. So my friend, a good friend of mine is Jamie Boulding. He owns um, Jungle Creations, which own oh, Twisted. I've, yeah, I know the Twisted guys. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, what do you make of that as a as a business? He's just opened up six, is it? Yeah. So five more additional to what he already had yep. in Allgate, and um, he's now servicing pretty much the entirety of London. Mm-hmm. You know, barring a few sort of dry spots, but he's got West London, North London, South London, Middle. And uh, and East London too. Yeah. So, what do you make of businesses that are kind of growing? I think his is very different because he had the audience. He's dragging it in and it's created very very different products. Yeah. But we're also seeing a, a move now to be. And it's also on the gravy trade of WeWork, where we're going. Okay, well, can we just create kitchens that do this? Yeah. And you could just Uber Eats it in. And like, what do you make of that as, as a business? Well, I I think you're being truly entrepreneurial then, looking at that and the fact that. There's no playbook really for it. We don't know how long, you know, the the Instagram generation engagement, all that's gonna gonna last. You know, something could happen in a year's time that there's a new channel or people stop loving Insta or, yep. you know, they're, they're, who knows. So, I think it's interesting. It it feels like at the moment people are just placing bets yep. and they're going to see what's happening. I think the biggest thing is you're at an advantage now if you can have low costs where the delivery hub or Uber Eats hub is low cost, you're banging it out all the rest of it but eventually I think the normal retail rules are going to apply which is people you know, might get sick of what you're doing you need to keep evolving Mm. what's your USP going to be this market's going to get saturated more people are going to do it and also if you're a tech person running a restaurant do you know that, or have you got enough support to help you you know build it and scale it and make it infrastructure all that stuff so I think we might see a few of these things biting the dust pretty quick I think that dark kitchens thing where bigger brands that people know and love or whatever secretly and in inverted commas then starting other brands I think the Daily Mail and all these guys will probably have a field day with that saying they've hoodwinked you it's just the same old stuff mm. so I think it's definitely worth investing in that right now will it be a 10 year strategy I don't know I yeah. think you could do really well in the next three. That's for sure. And food is an experience. Mm-hmm. So Instagram is a great enabler of that mm-hmm. because people want to share what's going on with their lives. Social media in general is a great enabler of that. People want to share what's going on. Yeah. And where they are, what they're eating, what they're doing, who they're with, all these different things. Yep. Food is a very central part of that. Mm-hmm. And so is the going out culture. And traditionally, if we see it, well, actually, if we look at it through people's lives, social media lives so you're 17 to 20 it's all about showing which nightclub you're going out yep. to and who you're with which mates you're with and then by about 20 22 to 26 it's about what restaurant you're eating in mm. what bar you're at and I think lots of restaurants are really cottoning onto that and we've seen a few that have really embraced the experience yep. side of things yep. 
and that marketing's been really smart. I think one that does it really well is a restaurant in Chelsea. I can never remember the name. Is it called Sketch? Oh yeah. Uh, which has that amazing floral mural in the uh, in the entrance. Right. And it just says Sketch in the middle, but it's okay. all pink flowers, and it's like the perfect. Is there a couple of sketches then? Maybe. Oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, could be. And there's and there's just the perfect. Instruction. Yeah, yeah. It's perfectly lit. Yeah. And everyone gets a photo there, and it's yeah. almost like you go. I've got no idea what food it serves. I've got no idea how good it is, but I know that as the restaurant in Chelsea. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting one because there's a little bit of a struggle within me, which is the shallowness of going to somewhere because of the way it looks, and you might not be that fussed about the food. Maybe, maybe, yep. maybe, or the people that just do amazingly good food but they haven't got their shit together in terms of, you know, being grabbable. Why people would actually want to go in the first place. Yeah. So, one of the sort of things is, you know, you you want to then have both happening. So, it is looking at that Instagram experience and I know a lot of people owning restaurants or who are maybe a bit older as well will be like, it's just a fad. I'm not doing, you know, it's like, look, it's here, it's the way it is. So, a, couple, a few examples are I was just doing a um, local store marketing course, ro- ro- local restaurant marketing course up in Scotland, and they were talking about the, the, the GMs that were there. Someone sending back a Bellini because it wasn't grammable enough. Right. So it's not how it tastes. It's not, and I know it's, it, looks, it sounds yeah. ludicrous, right? But it's a serious point in here, right? You've got to make sure that stuff's on point. Um, you've also got to make sure, and, and something I'm working with my clients on at the moment is, you, what your head of food thinks and your spec books think and all the rest of it, I, you know, people don't care really because presentation as a chef is one thing. Presentation as an Instagrammer is something completely different. Mm. So I think chefs and heads of food are, you know, a lot of them are good at this stuff, don't get me wrong, but I think people are going to need to relook at how things are coming out, what way it's going. I've got something in my mind. Someone is, was at the, it was maybe the Wolseley the other day. And the way they did their steak, it was like a huge big steak. And they had it on its end, like, like a big triangle. Oh, lovely. And yeah. the steam's coming off it. And, and you might not do it that way because you maybe want it resting. Or I mean, I don't know. But I think there's there's opportunity there. It's innovative to what to again, it's, it's the it's the customer experience yeah. first right if the yeah. customer wants that then yeah. why wouldn't you do it like that or actually it's sometimes the customer just being completely their mind bent with it's like what the, you've uh, done just the going, chocolate bomb is the, I didn't like, know you when could that do came that. out yeah. the chocolate bomb and yeah, you melt yeah, yeah. it in front of them yeah. and it's like wow what's going to come through and then know. back yeah I didn't know you could do that you know and it's almost yeah if, if you can bend their mind I think that's a good thing then there's the grammability thing so creating sets within your restaurant to make sure that um, you know people can get the shot. So what I'm advising GMs and, and, and companies to be doing is, when you see people coming in and you think they're of a grammable look or generation, or you know they're more likely to maybe oh. than some old people, I mean, that's been yeah. very judgmental, but you know. But figure out where your most grammable parts in your restaurant are, where the best light is. Invest in a light. It's, what, 80 quid, 100 quid for one of those circle lights? Invest in one. And if someone's standing on a chair and they're an influencer or whatever, you know, taking a shot, go and hug them. Because if they've got 2,000 followers, 20,000, 200,000, you want to be embracing that. Another thing I've been asking people to do is sit in every single seat in your restaurant around all different lights as well in terms of, you know, is it dusk, is it coming up, is it whatever, sunrise, whatever, and start understanding where the shadows are. And you might have a lighting problem because you know yourself, if you go to take that shot and there's your dirty great hand with an iPhone on it, you're not going to post it. Or if you need to put the flash on because you need it's to, so yeah, embarrassing in a, in a dark, dark yeah. uh, restaurant. And it's horrendous things. I mean, it, it's it's by the by because you might be the most talented chef in the world with the best ingredients in the world with the nicest dining room in the world like you know Berners Tavern let's say yeah, Berners Street Tavern I mean that's probably one of the greatest rooms in the UK at least you know but it's just one of those facts of life and, and you've got to move with the times you've got to stay ahead of that and, and, and give people what they want you know or you're going to lose out and, and a chef said the other month there and I can't even remember who said it, it was a great quote and said, when our table is for three, it's not for three, it's for 3,000. 
So they're making sure when that person comes in, they're going to share it and they're going to have an audience and those people are going to like it and that's going to go to their friends and, and, and. So if they have a great experience, great. If they have a bad experience, not so great. What a fantastic soundbite to finish it, <laughs> finish it all up. Um, thank you so much for, it's been for, a pleasure. for coming in. Really, really interesting no to, to chat about everything food and drink and a bit about your story too. Um, thank you so much for watching and listening to the Go Agency podcast. We're bringing in all sorts of different guests across different stories uh, from digital marketing to football to ice hockey, whatever you're, you're interested in. I'm sure we're going to be bringing out podcasts that are going to hit the bill in the next couple of weeks. And um, yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate sure. it. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon.